Welcome to To Life L'Chaim. On today's show, host Lee Lazarson talks with Ishai Fleischer, Israeli journalist and broadcaster, about life in Israel today and in the future. We'll be right back after these messages. With us in studio today, we're privileged to have with us Israeli journalist and broadcaster Yishai Fleischer. Uh, I know you do a lot in terms of uh, your journalism, working for Jewish Press. Your radio talk show host is uh, broadcast on a network uh, around the world, as well as live in Israel. Um, Yishai, it's a pleasure to have, us on, have you on Talei Fachayim. It's great to be here, Lee. Thank great. you so much. We're going to get uh, to a lot of discussions. Um, you live on the Mount of Olives, uh, and uh, you can share with us your life there. Um, but what is life like in Israel today? Well, you know, I, I marvel at life in Israel often. Uh, I've been living there now. I was born in Israel, but lived in America half my life. And I moved back and forth. But the last round, I moved back 10 years ago uh, with uh, my new wife, thank God. And uh, I always marvel at the life in Israel. Uh, though uh, we're surrounded by some folks who aren't so sympathetic to, uh, to the you know, great miracle of the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. Um, it is amazing the, the sense of fertility of life. It, it, just, it just blows my mind. It's sometimes like, a, like biting into a very rich food. There's, it's, it sometimes shocks you how many children you see playing in the parks and, and uh, at any kind of mass event when, when people are flooding into Jerusalem. The restaurant culture is, is another revolution that has happened. It's people in the restaurant, I've been seeing it in magazines, people have been writing about the food industry in Israel. Mm -hmm. There's just so much bubbling of life. For example, the old city of Jerusalem where I live next to, it's just I, I come there sometimes at night on the way home, maybe 10 o'clock at night. I'm amazed that they have so many groups. If it's uh, Russians, Asians, the Israeli army touring through the old city, just these massive groups of people. Massive amounts of food, massive amounts of children. It's something about Israel right now is very bubbling. Right. And, and uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Bible, the Torah, talks about how the Jews in Egypt were kind of under the thumb of, of slavery. And the more they, they were oppressed, the more they seemed to kind of, uh, you know, reproduce, break out. Break right. out and, and that's exactly it. And, and there's this, just this feeling about the country. And I, I drive to different parts of the country if it's the Dead Sea or it's Tel Aviv or it's the north or it's the south, and it's just so, buildings are going up, cranes, and uh, when I give speeches, I like to say that as I, as I walk through Jerusalem or drive through Israel, I always see two things, cranes and pregnant women. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the same thing, it's this real sense of, of life and liveliness. Uh, and I think that it's just, the atmosphere there is unparalleled. So I see a lot of young Jews uh, deciding to make their life in Israel or on birthright and just being excited by Israel. And you could just see the sense of wonderment at the, at the renewal of life, at the sense of, of, of birth, of rebirth that's happening in Israel right now on, on, on a level that's just breathtaking. Is there uh, a, a heightened state of alert with all that's transpiring in uh, Egypt and Iran? Is there that feeling that something terrible is imminent? I, I, think, I think that, that it's a lot more like same old, same old, Is you know? It? And not because, uh, and not because nobody takes this stuff seriously. It's just that Israel is a country that lives in a heightened state of alert all year round mm -hmm. and for the last 60 years. And it has no, that is part of our reality. It's a, it's a country that lives with conflict. And so I know that sometimes in America that seems so uh, not the, the, the zeitgeist of, of the United States, not, not the, the kind of ethos of everyday life, but in Israel it is. Uh, the army is part of life. Uh, seeing Sunday morning hundreds of soldiers with guns mm -hmm. boarding the buses to go to their bases. Uh, that's, that's part of life, being in reserve duty as I am. That, that's part of our life. Always having a certain amount of vigilance is, uh, is, is the way that, that Israelis live. But at the same time, you wake up in the morning and you have to get diapers for the kids and right. milk in, in the store. And that's the real life. And so, so, yeah, there's stuff going on in the Middle East. Since when has there not been stuff going on in the Middle East? So do these questions that uh, Americans ask Israelis because of the perception, because of the historical perception that's been presented in uh, our media of Israel, does it bother Israelis to have to answer you know, these kind of conversations of uh, 
that uh, it may not be safe to go there. Um, you know, all those kind of issues that come up. Is there, is there that feeling? Uh, I think that people have the right to be concerned and worried. It is a def definitely a region that has conflict in it, and, mm -hmm. you know, but sometimes people blow it out of proportion, you know, and any given weekend in Chicago is more violent than, than anything in Israel. And that's a fact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the world has different perceptions and always the other person's, you know, we say the grass is greener, it's like the grass is not greener. It's like right. over there it's scary. Uh, Israel is home to almost seven million Jews. Uh, life is, is very, uh, there's a lot of Jews and, and, and people who are making their life in Israel, minorities as well, Arabs, and we live a, a very normal life. Uh, somebody yesterday asked me, do you have electricity? And running water and stuff like that. It was cute, you know. I don't think he read Startup Nation, right. but uh, it doesn't bother me. I think it's I think it's fair to ask that. But I think that most of the time when people ask that, it's those people who haven't been there, and there's quite a bit of those, including Jews who have never been to to Israel. So you know, it's a kind of sense when you get there, it kind of gets rid of all those doubts and questions when you see it for yourself and you're not focused on the media hype. Don't forget the media, it doesn't report about babies born and, and the milk that I have to get in the morning. It doesn't, it doesn't talk about that. It talks about the negative things and therefore when you're living far away, that's the only nutrition and the, and the only information that you're getting about, about Israel is all this negative hype. Not to mention, you know, there's quite a bit of people out there who want to paint Israel as a very dark place. They mm -hmm. are the proponents of fear and darkness. Uh, what is terror? What is terror? Terror is the broadcasting of fear. Right. And so there are people who are in the business of broadcasting fear. They want Israel to remain small, disempowered, disenfranchised. They want to see Jews and others not connect to Israel, be afraid to go to Israel. So they're in the business of creating a fear factor about the state of Israel. I'm in the business of, of dissuading people from those beliefs, of helping them you know, come to a realization of what an incredible story we're part of right now, right. And, to, and to kind of make that leap or over those fears and, and plug into the most exciting story of our times. Is there, is there a sense, though, that uh, what might be coming with respect to uh, Iran, um, that could be something different that Israel hasn't seen? and obviously uh, quite a number of years and maybe even different from that? We've had, don't make me, don't make me uh, try to make light of the situation. Right. In no way am I, am I making light of it. Quite the opposite, I'm just saying that life in Israel always has that tension and we're ready for it. Okay. Uh, we're not... Because uh, I'm not in the business of painting uh, Israel as this dark place. I'm right. just trying to get a perception for our viewing audience of uh, it may not be the perception that the general media presents of Israel? Lee, I think it's very fair to be concerned about Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also concerned about Hezbollah. I'm very concerned about the 40,000 rockets that they have in their arsenal uh, ready to, to shoot at Israel. I'm concerned about chemical weapons moving around in Syria. I'm c concerned about weapons smuggling from North Africa through the Sinai to Hamas's hands. Uh, I'm concerned about Morsi and whatever he's thinking. There's a lot of factors out there. And, and, and my point is, is that we're actually constantly vigilant. Uh, and I think that our uh, r various agencies and our military is quite uh, queued up and, 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 and keyed up and, and, and focused on what's, what's happening there. We are very much paying attention to it. But if you ask the general atmosphere of Israel, okay. it's, it's, it's the same thing we've faced in the past. We have faced uh, terror wars. We have faced rocketeering. We have faced massive onslaughts of huge armies, six armies at one time coming against Israel. So we've seen a lot of this stuff. And I think that, you know, part of the Israeli ethos is to have that fortitude, that tenacity, and that kind of vision that we're going to get past this. And you know, all those haters of Israel, what do they, what do they base their whole you know, life on, their whole efforts on. It's all, it's all so, uh, you know, degraded, mm -hmm. it's so warped, and so unhealthy, not only for Israel, but for their own societies. And I do hope that the Arab societies around us will start to realize that Israel is the hope of the Middle East and not the, uh, the cause of all problems. Right. Well, let us break here, and we'll be back to talk about a whole lot more. We'll be right back.
We're back with Yishai Fleischer uh, again. Yishai, thank you for joining us. Uh, Wonderful to be here. Uh, obviously, uh, with the elections that have taken place uh, in Israel, uh, the rise of the uh, Yesh Atid party, uh, a move towards the center, uh, is that good for Israeli politics? I think it's excellent. Okay. Um, I think that Yesh Atid and the Bayit UD both represent basically young parties. <clears throat> young people involved in politics. Basically, young people voted for these parties. They are a young party, both of these parties. They're, they're young not only in, in age, I really mean just they're new faces in Israeli politics. We have some 50 some odd uh, new Knesset members in the Knesset. And that's great. That shows that people want change. They want kind of the old guard to uh, 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 exit the scene. They want new people who have uh, uh, new energies, renewed energies, and an excitement about about Israeli politics. I think that if we uh, think about politics as, as something that, that you see globally, a lot of people are kind of disgusted with, they don't want to deal with, they don't want to touch, and you see in Israel a kind of a renewed spirit of interest and involvement in the Knesset and in making great new laws, I think that's, that's good news. Uh, I'm also happy that for the fact that there's about 40 Knesset members who are observant mm -hmm. uh, in the Knesset, and I think that shows a, a tendency, it's a third of the Knesset, I think that shows a tendency of Israel to get back to roots to get back to tradition, uh, to get back to Jewish identity uh, as a central facet of what Israel is. I think that's very healthy. So, you know, you know I think to describe Yesh Atid as center is, is probably right, but I think that what does really center mean? What are we exactly referring to? Are we referring to security? Are we referring to economics? There's a lot of different issues out mm -hmm. there. Um, what does it refer to to you? What does it refer to in the people in Israel? Well, and that's, that's, that's exactly you know, the, the, the question, because in the Middle East right now, there's such a situation that the majority of Israelis have come to the conclusion that two-state solution type ideas and politics are not really working out. Uh, there's just no, uh, I'm not talking about the people who don't believe that we have the, the, the that we should. I'm not talking about people who think that religion mandates that we cannot give away land. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the pragmatic types who think that maybe it's a great idea to try to make peace with the Palestinians, uh, the Arabs living in Israel, by cutting up pieces of our of ancestral Israeli homeland and giving it to them. That, uh, uh, that, that paradigm has been practically disproven. And basically you have people like Yair Lapid, like Benjamin Netanyahu, who you know, don't think that in principle the two-state solution, solution is, a, is a bad idea, but they understand that it's completely not implementable right now. Uh, it's not implementable because it's been tried and failed, and also because the Arab world right now is in such a state of flux with, with jihadis kind of taking the lead, and so therefore it's, it's understood that if, let's say, uh, Israel would give away parts of the ancestral homeland of Judea and Samaria and try to evacuate hundreds of thousands of Jews from there, which is a practically impossible thing to do. Even if we did all that, it would yield nothing but a Hamas, a Hamas state mm -hmm. right in the midst of Israel. So that, in a sense, is, uh, is d redefining the center because the center, or even the left, is not talking so loudly about making concessions because it's not going to work right now. Uh, according to their pragmatic and, and, and very kind of rational thinking. So the, 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 the two-state solution is uh, something obviously that's been promoted um, in the West and, uh, and I would imagine in the Middle East as well for years upon years upon years. And so people can wrap their heads around because it's about making easy lines and defining um, borders and those kinds of things. Um, yet the, the other solutions, uh, we had uh, MK uh, Danny Danone in, um, a, a few months back, uh, following his book and his discussions of, of uh, different solutions, what are some of the other solutions that are pragmatic and uh, could be put into place? Well, first, it's important to understand that though it seems very clean and surgical to separate out populations, first thing, it's kind of regressive if you think about it, just this idea that you put up barriers between ethnicities. It's just something very, it's not today. It's mm -hmm. very not today. That's number one. Number two, it's actually not so clean. There are huge amounts of Arabs that live in the, the other parts of Israel that are not on discussion of being cut up. Uh, cut up uh, for example, Yafo, you know, right next to Tel Aviv, is populated a lot by Arabs. And to, to think about cutting away a lot of pieces, you basically are going to end up with a, with, a, you know, with a Swiss cheese kind of state. So 
that's not really realistic. And the Gaza experience has shown us that even when you cut away parts of the land, basically what happens is that it gets taken over by jihadis and becomes a front uh, against Israel. So for all these reasons, it's kind of been disproven uh, empirically mm -hmm. that this idea is a good idea. Uh, so now you're asking about new ideas. Well, let me, look, before we do that, we're going to break. And then we can come back, you can share um, your thoughts for uh, a multiple state solution or however you want to uh, discuss it as well as some others that are being uh, discussed within Israel. Looking forward. Okay. We'll be right back. We're back in studio with Yishai Fleischer. Uh, you were discussing uh, the different solutions for peace in the region. Well, I was uh, explaining how the two-state solution paradigm has basically been empirically disproven. And um, now we're talking about the various options for how to move ahead. Uh, you said multiple state before. I would say really one state mm -hmm. is what we're talking about. And there's a few various ideas out there on the table. One is that Jordan, which is uh, slated to fall to, uh, to uh, slated to fall, the, the monarchy could very well topple at any point and really become what it is naturally, which is a Palestinian state. If that happens, then it could be that Palestinians, Arabs living in Israel, will have the right to vote uh, in uh, Jordan, but continue to have the residency uh, in Israel. That's the Jordan is Palestine option, which was put forward by uh, Ariel Dodd and Ben Is Yalone. that supported by the people of Jordan? No, not okay. necessarily, not necessarily, but also uh, it hasn't been discussed very publicly out there because that would be seditious against the crown right. at, the time, at this time. So, but that is an option that Israel is thinking about, how to basically give people, Arabs living in Israel, uh, rights to vote in their country, a Palestinian state, um, and not have to vote in Israel, but be able to retain their rights to live, and that's uh, residency rights. Um, that's one option. Another option that has been really talked about much more by uh, Naftali Bennett, the head of the uh, by TUD party, the Jewish Home Party, and also by Danny Danone, more or less, they have the same kind of idea, which is assert sovereignty or annex area C. This is the area where most of the Jews living in Judea and Samaria live, not 95% of them. We're talking about 300,000 Jews. We're talking about, about 40,000 Arabs. Annex those areas and make them part of mainland Israel, which makes a lot of sense because these, these places are Israel. Mm -hmm. They're ancestral Israel, They're, the people of the state of Israel live there, Israeli mail goes there, Israeli buses goes there, Israeli mm -hmm. electricity goes there, and so it's really Israel. So, you know, annex, it, it's actually, if you think about it, it's the continuation of the Oslo process, really. And Area C was slated to be under Jewish control, so we'll continue to be under so Jewish control. So this is not for, um, you know, most of our audience who refer to it as the West Bank, it's not the entire West Bank. It's only a portion of right. the Right. It's pockets of the West Bank. But then, not to create a Palestinian state wherever, the, wherever Israelis are not found, but rather leave it as a kind of, you know, kind of uh, undefined area, unclaimed area, where there's my, my other minorities living there. And that's, it's kind of a piecemeal, a step-by-step -step process. But mm. the next logical step is annex, uh, assert sovereignty over the Israeli populations there and give them, you know, normal citizenry rights and no, normal... Uh, voting those Arabs that will be part of that uh, annexation will uh, also be granted Israeli citizenship like regular Israeli Arabs. And that's a step forward uh, in asserting you know, sovereign rights over parts of Judea and Samaria. Do the Arabs that live in those areas, are they comfortable with that? Well, let me tell you, uh, we don't know exactly about that, but we do know that uh, Israeli Arabs are quite, the Arabs that already have Israeli citizenship are quite concerned lest they somehow fall back uh, into an Arab state. We see it over and over again that 77% uh, of, of, of Arabs in, 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 uh, in Jerusalem uh, that have Israeli residency are very afraid that the Palestinian Authority will somehow take over their lives. They really flee away from that. And with good reason, because you see that, 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 that so many of the Arab states today are really unhealthy uh, and, and, and corrupt. And really, we see that, that forward mobility, upward mobility, health, and, and uh, all, all the services that Israel really has to offer are far superior to what most Arab countries offer. So Israeli Arabs continue to have their ethnic identity as Arabs uh, and Muslims. Some of them even call themselves Palestinians, but they live in Israel and, and they're, happy, they're happier for it. Um, and that's another option. But my favorite option is what I like to call the Yishai plan, mm -hmm. uh, which is my own plan on, on this issue, which really uh, is a little bit more, I would say, holistic. 
And basically what we're talking about is asserting sovereignty all of all, over all of Judea and Samaria. And that's our ancestral homeland, that's the land that was seen as ours by the international community in the 20s, that's where the mandate was supposed to be to create a Jewish state. And basically the Arabs, and that's a big question, what happens to the Arabs living there? The Arabs living there get residency status immediately. Mm -hmm. First thing, they become residents of the state of Israel. They're like green card benefit residents. They're like green card holders. And, and they get to, to live in Israel, which is a privilege. No but voting rights. No voting rights immediately, but then a pathway <laughs> to citizenship for those people who follow Israeli law, pay their taxes, serve either in the Israeli army or national service, uh, and don't act seditiously. Yes, mm -hmm. we have a pathway to citizenship. Uh, I would, uh, since Israel is first and foremost a Jewish state and only then a democratic state, I mean, say the first order of business that Israel has to do is to give the security of the rights and the freedoms and the welfare of Jewish citizenry in Israel, because we are first and foremost a Jewish state, not a democratic right. state. The not democratic sure the world recognizes that. Well, the world can recognize uh, the, the, the rest of the region, and the rest mm -hmm. of the region is, is practically you know, ethnic monarchies, mm -hmm. and so we have an ethnic democracy. Uh, it's a Jewish state. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious, and if you look around the other countries, they are Arab states, and we have a Jewish state. Right. We, we treat our minorities far superior than, uh, than other countries uh, treat them, and, and we, we do it with, with great pride. We, we take a lot of pride in the fact that our Arab citizens uh, live a decent, normal life. Uh, but in any, case, in any case, there's a pathway to citizenship for those folks who really are proud and happy to be part of the, the state of Israel. If a person, on the other hand, wants to be seditious, wants to undermine the sovereignty and the territorial integrity uh, of, of Israel, then they will find their place either in prison or outside of the borders of Israel, because we have to, first and foremost, defend the security of, of Jewish citizens. That, that's our mandate. So that, those are the various plans in place, and uh, I think that you're going to see a period right now where there's going to be another effort to try to force Israel, to strong arm Israel into going into a, a, a two-state kind of paradigm and, and discussions. I, I, it's not going to lead anywhere. Right. Because uh, some of the voices, and we've got about a minute left, but some of the voices in Israel um, speak very loudly on uh, two-state solution. That's the, that's Less the, loudly than before, Lee. Less, Less loudly. loudly. Than, that's good. Less okay. loudly than before because it just doesn't make any more sense. And I think that the, the country wants a, a, a more nationalistic, prideful, Jewish, strong, and, and get back to, to, to making it clear that our first order of business is to defend Israel and to, and, and to, and to create a country that's going to be a light to the nations. First and foremost, a light to the Middle East, which desperately needs it. Right. And the time we have left, uh, I know you want to talk about and, and let our audience know where they can get in touch with you. Sure. You know, uh, my website is ishaifleischer.com. I get to do the only English language talk show on broadcast radio in the state of Israel. That's really neat. And I'm on tour. Uh, and I love to speak in the United States. I love to connect to people if people agree with me or don't agree with me. And I've partnered just on that principle. Uh, of, of all kinds of people out there that love Israel with Nefesh Benefesh, which is the Aliyah organization, the organization that lets people consider life in Israel. And we're out here uh, uh, speaking uh, and giving people the opportunity to uh, sign up for two free tickets to Israel if they'd very like. Good. And great stuff is happening. Very good. Yishai Fleischer, a pleasure. Thanks Thank so you very much. much. Shalom, shalom. That's it for this edition. For more information on our show, please visit us on the web at tolifelechaim.com. I'm Lee Lazarson. Thank you very much for joining us. And to life, L'chaim. <laughs>